Almost 400 subglacial lakes are already known and on this map you can see that the lakes form a gigantic, interconnected network under the ice. This is not really surprising, because we must not forget that Antarctica is basically a normal continent, and not just ice floating on the ocean like the Arctic in the Northern Hemisphere. Antarctica has a huge land mass and, like other continents, rivers and lakes, just hidden under the thick ice sheet. Now some of you may be asking, How can water be liquid? It's cold in Antarctica. In fact, the average temperature in Antarctica is about minus 55 degrees Celsius. So it's just about t-shirt weather. But two factors make liquid water possible beneath the surface, pressure and geothermal energy. The melting point of ice drops under pressure, so it melts faster the further it is buried under the mighty Antarctic ice sheet. And the further down it is, the stronger the geothermal heat from the Earth's interior. Both factors are then sufficient to create the perfect conditions for subglacial lakes. The largest of these subterranean lakes is Lake Vostok in East Antarctica, which is 30 times larger than Germany's Lake Constance and lies for kilometers below the surface. Now, of course, it is incredibly interesting to see if there is life down there and what fascinating ecosystem can thrive in such an extreme environment. Because as we all know from Jurassic Park, Das Leben bahnt sich seinen Weg, es erobert neue Territorien, es überwindet sämtliche Barrieren, ob schmerzlich oder gefährlich, aber... Aber so ist es. Don't even get me started on the new Jurassic World 3 movie, what a piece of trash in contrast to the first, masterful Jurassic Park movie. Das ist ja ein Riesenhaufen Scheiße. But away from the Dinos, back to Antarctica. How to explore the subglacial water system. Scientists from New Zealand used a probe to do this, gliding it along a subglacial river just to see what fascinating things the probe would pick up there. Professor Craig Stevens, who was involved, says, We've done experiments in other places on the ice shelf before and thought we had a handle on things, but this time there were big surprises. For a while we thought something was wrong with the camera. But as the focus improved we notice a swarm of arthropods about 5 mm in size. That's right, the probe found shrimp-like creatures under the mighty Antarctic ice, swimming around quite happily until their arthropod party was disturbed by the probe. And I won't keep you in suspense any longer, here is the original footage from the probe. I find it inconceivable that life can thrive in these extreme conditions. I sometimes find it hard to keep my life under control in these conditions. But the animals discovered are not a new species, they were known to science before. But their existence under the Antarctic ice shelf is still surprising. The question now is where the animals get their food. The New Zealand research team is now having a sample of the water analyzed to find out what nutrients are present there as a food source for. The Antarctic shrimps, and this is only the beginning of the research, for the research team believes that they have stumbled upon a gigantic subglacial structure. Beneath the ice shelf is a cathedral-like cavern hundreds of meters high and teeming with life. Truly one and done, like something out of a Jules Verne novel. The researchers have left instruments there that will now provide more and more data about this subglacial cave in the coming years. Some of you will no doubt now be saying, Shrimp under the ice? Who cares? I think that such discoveries are also interesting in terms of space exploration. Because in principle, on the icy moons of the gas planets, like Europa and Enceladus, a very similar environment exists to that in Antarctica. Their surfaces are covered with kilometer-thick ice and underneath is liquid water, a subglacial ocean. If life can exist under the ice in Antarctica, then that increases the chances that the ice moon oceans are not too extreme for life either. But of course you have to keep the differences in mind, that's clear. 
the landmass of Antarctica was much more life-friendly in prehistoric times and even harbored forests, and a rich variety of flora and fauna. There was very probably nothing like that on the icy moons. But, remember Jeff Goldblum, life always finds a way, and that's why I think it's relatively likely that alien shrimp or something like that could exist in the alien ocean of the icy moons. Feel free to write me your view in the comments, does life exist on the icy moons? Or is the comparison with Antarctica not at all suitable for drawing such conclusions? I would be very interested to hear what you think. Ice, subglacial lakes, exotic life forms, it's all extremely fascinating. But Antarctica is also the perfect research location for quantum physics studies. And recently, some physicists who have been holding out at a research station, surrounded by blizzards and minus 50 degrees Celsius, have come across something, a ghost particle. What is it? And why will it revolutionize our understanding of our cosmos? If you're still not sure what career you should pursue when you grow up, here's an absolute dream job. Researcher at the Ice Cube Observatory in Antarctica. This is a research station in the middle of the largest ice desert on our planet, whose goal is to detect so-called neutrinos. Neutrinos are often called ghost particles because their mass is almost zero. They travel at almost the speed of light and usually do not really interact with normal matter. In other words, for a neutrino, the entire universe is almost disembodied, somehow ghostly. Very rarely, however, it does interact with matter. And this is how Ice Cube works, when a neutrino interacts with Antarctic ice, it can produce a flash of light. Sensors tunneled deep under the ice can then detect these flashes. Here you can see one of these sensors, of which Ice Cube has a total of over 5,000. There have to be so many of them because a neutrino collision is extremely rare. If you only had a few dozen sensors in use, you would have to wait a very long time for a hit. And waiting a very very long time in Antarctica is a bit boring and very very cold. When the ice cube scientists then register a hit, they can find out some properties about the neutrino from the data they have collected. Using features such as the spread of the brightness of the flash of light produced by the collision, they can determine the energy level of the neutrino and the direction from which it came. The direction is of course particularly interesting, as one then has at least an indication of where and from which event the neutrino could have originated. Then in 2019, a relatively coherent sequence of events occurred, on the 9th of April, a collision was discovered between a star and a black hole in a galaxy 750 million light-years away. Astronomers christened this event AT2019 DSG. Astronomers really should think of nicer names for things. What exactly happened here? A black hole and a star got a little too close, and the death of the star by a black hole is not a neat, orderly process. So the star doesn't just plop and go. When a star gets so close to a black hole that it is caught by its gravity, the powerful tidal force of the black hole, that is, the interaction of gravity and angular momentum first expands the star. This process is known as spaghettification. This then pulls the star so far that it is torn apart. This is called a tidal disruption event, or TDE for short. Half of the remnants of the torn star then swirl in a disk around the black hole, generating immense heat and light, before being torn inexorably across the event horizon into the endless gravitational depths. The other half of the remnant is ejected into space. And in the AT2019 DSG event, a supermassive black hole 30 million times the mass of the Sun underwent a tidal disruption event. In such a violent event, neutrinos could potentially be ejected. Sure enough, barely six months later, on the 1st of October, 2019, a neutrino was detected at the Ice Cube Observatory in Antarctica. Bingo! Oh, I got a bingo! For the sake of completeness, the researchers gave this neutrino the designation IC191001A, Phew. So the story seemed to fit perfectly. The neutrino detected in October. 
was a perfect match for the big gravitational snack a black hole 750 million light years away had indulged in, and observed in April. All questions answered. But, I have one more question. One other thing. And not just me, but astronomer Yvette Sendes of Harvard University Center for Astrophysics. She asked, if this neutrino somehow came from AT200219 DSG, it begs the question, why have we never detected neutrinos associated with stellar explosions at this distance or closer? If the tidal disruption event really was the origin of the ghost particle, then neutrinos should actually be detected much more often. So a team of researchers led by Yvette Sendes took another close look at the distant event. They used the ALMA radio telescope in Chile to observe AT2019 DSG in the radio wave range for over 500 days. They found that the tidal disruption event became progressively brighter in the radio waveband over the 200-day period, and then it peaked and slowly began to fade. They also calculated the total amount of energy from the event and it was roughly equivalent to the energy. And now brace yourselves, that the sun emits in 30 million years. A tidal disruption event, that is, a black hole that can engulf a star, can emit as much energy in such a short period of time as the sun does in 30 million years. Wow. But, and here's the thing, that's pretty normal for such a tidal disruption event quite normal amount of energy emitted in such an event, nothing special. But to produce a neutrino as energetic as IC191001A, the neutrino that was detected in October 2019, the energy of the tidal disruption event would have to be about 1000 times higher. All very complex, a lot of technical terms, I know, so I'll say it again in other words. The black hole explosion that was thought to be the origin of the neutrino was 1,000 times too weak to be the true cause. But no bingo! No. That leaves one, not entirely insignificant question, where did the detected neutrino come from then? The answer, no one knows. After the matter was thought to be solved, it is now as mysterious again as it was at the very beginning. My guess would be that the cause may simply have been another tidal disruption event, in which an even heavier black hole tore apart an even more massive star, but that this event is much further away and therefore escaped the notice of vigilant astronomers. But this is just a hypothesis of mine, it remains that the origin of the ghost particle remains ghostly. Researching for ghost particles in Antarctica, far away from all other humans, sounds like an absolute dream job to me. Until you accidentally open the gates to a parallel universe. We'll find out what's up with this crazy story spread by the media in the next part of our Antarctica series. And if you want to support my work, treat yourself to the shirts from the videos, real meteorites and fluffy plush planets in the space shop. Otherwise I would say, let's see the next video. Take care, guys.